Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. We'll give people a bit more time to log on before we start the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I propose we start. Welcome to this one but last webinar of the year, The Value of Water in Canada. We're very happy to see you online again. Thank you for joining. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we're participating today from traditional territories of the First People, and I participate today from land that is part of the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, and as you can see on this map, our campus is situated on the so-called Haldeman Track land, land that was granted to the Six Nations and includes six miles on each side of the Grand River, um, the watershed um, of the Grand River where the University of Waterloo is located. The University of Waterloo and its centers and institutes like the Water Institute are committed to raise awareness and contribute to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls for action. And I encourage you all to take a moment to recognize the traditional land where you are. So we're very happy to have Professor Patrick Lloyd Smith with us today. I'm gonna to do a very brief introduction and then hand over the floor to him. Um, as always, we'll have a 30, 40 minutes presentation followed by questions and, and answers. Um, during the presentation, please enter your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat, but in the Q&A box, please. And then Pat will get to those questions after his presentation. So the, presentation, the presenter today is Patrick Lloyd-Smith. As mentioned, he's an assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan. He is a professor of water and resource economics in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. He's also a member of the Interdisciplinary Global Institute for Water Security, where he contributes his economics expertise into ongoing work modeling Canada's water future. His research focuses on environmental resource valuation and the integration of these values into economic analysis. And today he's going to talk to us about learning about water values through behavior. Pat, we're very happy to have you with us today, and I'm happy to hand over the floor to you. All right, and the slides are showing. Um, let me yes. know if they're not. Okay, great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks everyone um, for coming here. Roy, thanks for the introduction. Um, really uh, looking forward to uh, this talk. I've really enjoyed the series so far. I think it's been a really good uh, breadth of uh, different talks on um, different aspects of water and water valuation. So today, uh, hoping to share a couple of studies about uh, people's behavior involving water and how we can use those, that type of information to understand how people value different aspects of water. So we know water is a very sort of complex, multi-aspect uh, good that get used in a bunch of whole different instances. So we all, always got to be a bit careful when we talk about what is the value of water. Well, what, what are we talking about there? And so I'll uh, share a couple of um, research efforts in this uh, domain. Um, all this research is sort of ongoing, especially the latter one is very preliminary. So I'm really open to kind of feedback people have. Feel free to ask a question throughout or uh, at the end um, um, of uh, the presentation. So I'll uh, jump right in here. Um, so people often say water is very important to Canadians and partly because in our daily lives, in our monthly lives, in our annual lives, we make a lot of different choices involving water. Recreation, where do we go recreate? Maybe what sort of house or re recreational property we buy, but it can also be a just simple of, well, where are we getting our drinking water from? from bottled water, tap water, um, perhaps uh, other sort of more consumptive recreation activities such as hunting or fishing sort of rely on sort of water or water ecosystems as well, as well as sort of different aspects of flooding and flood risks and thinking about protective behavior around there um, on the flooding side. All to say is we make a lot of decisions involving water. And what I'm interested uh, 
primarily as an economist or just in my research is, well, what can we, using this information on different decisions involving water, what can we learn about people's sort of uh, values for water overall? And there are many different ways to think about the value of water or just the value of nature more broadly. So I think just even this term, sort of the value, it means a lot of different things to different people, to different disciplines, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around this more sort of recent intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services report that just came out earlier, where they're really trying to sort of provide a bit more organization around the different ways that people get values from nature uh, or with nature or uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and partly why I say this and say, okay, there's a lot of different ways um, of thinking about value is, well, what do we mean as economists? So what do I mean when I say what's the value of water as an economist? In the back of my mind, I'm thinking sort of something around consumer surplus or producer surplus. So it's sort of a very specific definition of value, but I think it's helpful to kind of outline at the beginning because there's many different ways of valuing water. They all have their sort of pros and cons and uh, different worldviews accompanying them. Um, but economists, we tend to be sort of in our back of our mind, we're thinking of something like this, which is sort of a, our classic sort of demand curve. We have price on the y-axis, some sort of measure of quantity or quality on the x-axis. And we can go out and maybe collect some data, understand people's spending. So sort of that square, the price times the quantity gets sort of some aspect of expenditure. But what we really want to get is the area under the demand curve, but above price. So we want to get this sort of triangle or this kind of consumer surplus. So we have squares, we've got triangles. Maybe, you know, what's the kind of the difference? Well, squares we can see in data because often we have sort of prices and quantities of different goods, but triangles we can't. So that's sort of one of the big main differences is triangles we're going to have to try and estimate. So we're going to have to try and use different techniques to sort of estimate uh, demand curves and derive consumer surplus. And all that to say is that's going to be a challenge for us because there's no way that we can sort of verify whether we're getting this correct information or not to say there's no way, but it's just more challenging to kind of assess the validity of it. So that's sort of challenge number one with trying to get these triangles. But when we go to, in particular, environmental goods and services or a lot of aspects of water, we typically don't have prices, um, thankfully, as we'll, we'll uh, return to in a bit. But that just makes it more challenging when we are trying to estimate these sort of demand curves for different aspects of water because we don't have prices. Um, so we're going to have to be a bit creative and trying to find proxies for those prices. And then in addition, sometimes the quantity isn't as well defined as well. So as practitioners, we're going to have to work with both this prices and quantities side as well. I think this is just helpful to uh, say at the beginning, because it also gives us insight into what's not sort of a valid welfare measure, at least from an economist perspective, right? So if we just look at sort of changes in GDP, in a way, that's just looking at changes in that price times quantity, changes in expenditures. So that's not the triangle that we want. In addition, often uh, people report sort of the recreation expenditures as sort of a proxy of benefits. But again, that's the square, not the triangle. <laughs> so what can we do uh, to try and estimate those sort of different triangles for different aspects of water? As I said, um, often they don't have, water doesn't have a price tag. Typically that's a good thing from sort of an equity and a societal standpoint but it still has value, right? And that's sort of uh, one of the aspects that makes non-market valuation uh, as a methodology interesting is we're trying to understand value for these things that don't have prices. And in a way, there's sort of two overall um, techniques. So one, you can go ask people in sort of structured conversations what sort of trade-offs people will make. There's sort of this stated preference bucket. Um, there's been some earlier talks in this series um, you know, talking about uh, these state of preference techniques. And so that's going to rely typically on surveys, but there's a whole host of different ways that we can sort of ask these types of questions. And then we can also look at decisions that people did make. And so actually make in practice. And these are these sort of revealed preference techniques. Um, and here we're going to kind of learn about preferences and values through this past behavior. 
And that's going to be the sort of focus of uh, this talk today. A lot of differences uh, and a lot of time gets spent on kind of comparing these two methods. Often it just comes down to, well, what are you trying to value to begin with? What sort of uh, change? What's the available data? And, you know, typically we could imagine, or at least economists tend to sort of kind of prefer revealed preference data over state of preference methods. You know, we don't really trust surveys. We want to rely on sort of good, hard, uh, observed behavior. But I want to emphasize that's not always the case. They both have pros and cons. And one of the challenges with a lot of the revealed preference data is, or pre revealed preference methods, in addition to sort of finding the data, or, you know, is the data available? But even once we get the data, we only have information on what people did. So we only have information on what they chose. We don't know what they considered to choose. So we don't kind of have information on that choice set. Um, we also don't necessarily have information on what are those factors that made someone choose one thing over the other. So in a way, yes, we have the data on what people did. That's great. But now we sort of, now the hard work begins because now we got to start thinking about, well, what were they choosing? What was their choice set? that they're choosing from, what were some of the factors that were making them choose one way or the other, and we don't have the benefit of asking survey questions. And so, the, you know, for both of these uh, methods, I just want to emphasize, you know, they both have pros and cons, but I'm going to kind of talk about two studies that use sort of revealed preference techniques here. Um, and why I think it's important in the Canadian context is we've kind of really dropped off on doing revealed preference studies in Canada. So this is uh, a, a figure summarizing sort of the percentage of these methods used in different valuation studies in Canada across the last few decades. So we can see back in the 1980s, it was about 50-50 between stated preference and revealed preference. Some studies used both methods, that's why they don't quite sum to 100. And then you can see since the 80s, there's sort of this growing divergence where, you know, in current, uh, in the 2010s, um, it's about 80% stated preference studies, and we're down to about under 20% revealed preference studies. So there's been this really big divergence in uh, methods or how they're applied in Canada. We can talk about some of the reasons why that might be the case. I'd be curious of what other people's thoughts are um, as well. But I think there's still a real need for these types of studies uh, going forward. And then the final point, just before jumping into the studies, is this other question that often gets kind of missed is, well, whose behavior and values are we examining or are we studying? And I'm most uh, familiar with the recreation demand literature. And here, I think often people are thinking sort of that um, movie uh, trailer on the right there, The Great Outdoors, it's typically sort of middle-aged white males that uh, studies that are doing. So on the left-hand side, you have, uh, this is looking at in North America, how many value estimates for different recreation activities. And we can actually see for hunting and fishing, it's about 57% of the total value estimates that are out there that have been estimated in North America are just for hunting and fishing. If we compare that to what people are doing, well, we can see that hunting and fishing, at least in Canada, are only about 4% of people's sort of recreation behavior or 4% of the trips that people are taking. And there's a whole whack load of other recreation activities, bird watching, uh, camping, um, whole hiking, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of behavior and values outside of hunting and fishing. So whenever we're thinking about these revealed preference studies, because we're not necessarily doing a state of preference survey of the whole population or the general population, it really kind of begs this question, well, whose values are we um, studying as we're going about uh, applying these methods? Okay. And then, sorry, final point, and then I'll jump into the study. So why are we doing this to begin with? Why, you know, why do we want to understand sort of the value of nature? Well, one of the, you know, most compelling uses is to integrate these into different assessment models, right? So this is one from Kaiser and Mueller, or just a, a graphic sort of showing how we can go for different sort of pollution, air or water pollution, how we can link that to sort of physical effects on natural systems and humans. And then we can see the important role that valuation plays at sort of valuing those impacts at the end, right? So we can 
yes, we get these values for different uses of um, water, different sort of costs of pollution, and we can think that we could feed these back into different integrated assessment models. Okay, so study number one, we're going to talk about water-based recreation, and then the next one, we're going to talk about uh, hedonic um, property value studies. Um, so recreation, you know, in terms of spending, it's about 2% of Canada's GDP. Um, but the benefits that people get from recreation are about twice that in terms of dollar amounts. So that the square um, or that triangle is about twice the size of the square, at least based on past, uh, past studies that have estimated. And so this study that I'm going to share with today is looking at camping trips in Alberta's provincial parks. So we have um, about eight years of camping trip data. We're going to link that to different water advisories data. And we're going to look, look at this data to examine a few different questions. Well, first off, we just want to understand, do people sort of respond to water quality advisories? I'll describe what I mean by water quality advisory, but just think of that as like a change in water quality at the campground lake. So do people respond to that? What are sort of the um, costs or of having one of these advisories in place. But then we're also interested in looking at comparing the values across these different years, because we have eight years of data. Um, well, we could estimate models for each of these eight years and then compare values across different years. So this sort of temporal reliability aspect, we'll kind of look at that as well. And I'll uh, explain why I think that's an important uh, part of this recreation demand uh, literature. And then we also kind of within a year, I'm going to share some evidence of how people sort of respond to these water quality advisories. So a water quality advisory gets issued. How long do we see sort of this before behavioral responses happens? I mean, there's people, well, we already planned our trip. We're just going to go anyway. Or do, do people respond a bit more immediately to these water quality advisories? So those are kind of the three main questions I'll talk about uh, today. So just a, a few notes on the data. So this is administrative data. So this is actually the reservations uh, that people uh, make when they book sort of a camping site in Alberta or at one of their provincial parks. Um, so each person kind of logs onto the system and we can track each individual's ID over time within the year as well as across different years. Um, if you cancel a reservation, you're actually removed from the data, but we don't know if you canceled the reservation or not. We just don't see you in the data. As I said, there's sort of eight years of data, um, and we're going to sort of focus on the summer season. So most of these camping sites here, we're on the prairie, so it's a pretty short season. It's about, you know, Victoria Day to Labor Day, and we're just going to keep that sort of as our uh, camping season, call it sort of our summer season overall. Also, this is kind of when um, sort of there's uh, not ice on the lakes, or most years the ice is gone by the end of May. Um, at least in most of the campgrounds, but not all of them up in the Rockies as well. All that to say, there's about 61 campgrounds in the analysis, um, and these we're just going to focus on the ones that are open all eight years, or at least have we have data access to the data for all eight years. Um, and then we're going to exclude some sort of, you know, sort of fancy ones like the luxurious kind of the glamping sites, as well as the big group sites where you can have multiple parties um, or horseback riding campgrounds as well. So we're just going to kind of focus on that basic, you show up with a tent and you can camp. So none of the sort of RV camping as well. Um, as part of this data, we have the postal code for each of the campers, and we're going to use that to um, calculate the travel cost, as well as we're just going to focus on people in Alberta. So we're going to exclude people outside of, the Al uh, outside of Alberta, sorry, folks in BC and Saskatchewan. Um, but probably people that are traveling greater distances across provinces have multiple destinations in mind, so it's a bit harder to handle. So we're just focusing on Albertans in this case. That's a little bit on the camping data. What do I mean by an advisory? So what happens is an advisory gets issued, so they do water quality testing at all these lakes, typically once a week, sometimes even more, depending on the, the conditions. And if there's any visible signs of an algae bloom, uh, especially the, sorry, the blue-green algae bloom that sort of the most uh, poses the highest uh, health risks, they'll go up and post one of these signs, as well as they'll put it online, they'll share it with the local media, 
So it sort of gets broadcast to potential uh, um, um, campers that you should not swim at this lake. So it's sort of an advisory saying, you know, if you have contact with um, this water, bad things can happen. You should take a shower after, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what sort of this water advisory is. It gets issued by the actually Alberta Health Services. So it's sort of really sort of a human health uh, aspect. Um, there's also a sort of risk to dogs and pets and other stuff as well. Um, but I think what's interesting here is these advisories gets issued at different times of the year at different campgrounds or at different lakes at different campgrounds, as well as um, across different years, they get issued at different times. And sort of most of the recreation demand literature that focuses on water quality uses sort of a single annual average water quality at the, um, at the lake or at the river, whatever they're studying, tends to be sort of secchi depth or some other sort of, sort of physical scientific measure that might or might not be as salient for people. So I think these advisories potentially are a lot more salient for folks because you know they got a posted sign right at the lake and it gets uh, shared across the media as well. But that also means that we're able to kind of capture some of these changing water quality throughout the season, which I'm gonna argue is quite important in this context. And just to illustrate this, this is uh, some remote sensing data at Pigeon Lake, which is one of the more popular recreation lakes um, in Alberta. And this is just looking at from about beginning of June to end of October. And you can see the sort of changing colors, sort of showing the changing water quality. This is sort of measured by chlorophyll uh, in this case. But I think this sort of really drives home the point that water quality actually really does change a lot throughout the season. And so really kind of capturing that is going to be important when it comes to the modeling. Um, so when we look at um, the campgrounds and the lakes associated with those campgrounds in our data set, and we look across the eight years of the data, this um, figure shows when the advisories kind of come on and potentially off, but typically when they get issued, they stick around for the rest of the year across the different seasons. So again, I said there was about 61 campgrounds in the study, about 23 had um, an advisory issued, and so this just kind of shows that sort of variation on that seasonal timing that I was talking about that I think is going to be really important for sort of helping us identify the effect of uh, water quality. Okay, so that's a little bit on the water quality. We just look at a little bit on the data. And here I just wanted to show sort of the number of trips, how many people are camping, as well as sort of how many campgrounds had a, a water advisory in each of these years as well as the total overall days um, that an advisory was in place across any of the campgrounds. And you can see, at least on the advisory side, things do sort of bounce around a bit, but it's pretty stable. I mean, it's not like there's one year where there's no advisories in place, um, but you can see sort of 2018, there's sort of quite a few a bit less, but you know, 2015 is uh, about the same as the rest as well. And then just in as given order of magnitude for the number of trips, we're looking at about 90,000 to 130,000 trips that we're going to use for the model. Okay, so that's a little bit on the data. We're going to be calculating travel costs. So we're going to be thinking of travel costs as sort of a proxy of the price of accessing these camping sites. Nothing sort of new and creative here. This is sort of just um, your pretty standard recreation demand travel cost calculation some sort of measure of out-of-pocket driving expenses, the value of the time. And then here we actually have the camping cost. So you have a camping nightly uh, fee, as well as you have a reservation fee as well. So we're gonna kind of put that all together to try and capture the sort of resources people have to give up to access these camping uh, sites over time. And then we're gonna, because we're gonna compare across years, we're gonna sort of convert them all to $2016 um, overall. In terms of the model that we'll be uh, estimating, this is gonna be a multinomial logit model. It's just gonna be a site choice model. So we're really studying that decision of where do we wanna go camping? We're not gonna take into account this sort of participation decision. Do I wanna go camping or not? And then if I do, where do I wanna go? So we're just sort of focusing on the site choice. Primarily that was based on some preliminary results that said sort of more that participation decisions less important in this context. So. We have estimated some nested logit models. They didn't seem to be as appropriate for our context in place. But the model itself is um, not, you know, 
fairly uh, fairly simple in terms of we're just going to have travel costs. So one factor affecting what campground you're going to choose is how how much it costs you to go. We're going to have is there a water quality advisory in place or not? Yes or no, and that's going to change throughout the season as well as across the campgrounds as well. And then we're going to have an alternative specific constant for each of the campgrounds as well. And we're going to use that to kind of soak up all the other sort of um, unobserved reasons for why one campground might be preferred by another. So that's going to kind of soak up all the other reasons that we know that are important for camping, right? It's not just about water quality. There's a whole host of other reasons why people might choose a different site. So we're going to use sort of alternative specific constants to capture that. If we just look a little bit at the model estimates themselves, um, first off, we can see if we just look at the travel cost coefficient, it's negative, few, thankfully. So people don't like to kind of travel or pay more to go camping. Okay, that's good. As well as we see for that water quality or sorry, water advisory, that's also negative. And, you know, I, we I shouldn't be comparing coefficients across years, but just sort of eyeballing them, they look fairly. Uh, about the same order of magnitude, except for that 2015, which seems to be quite a bit less as well as um, quite noisy if we look at the standard errors. So we're gonna use these model coefficients to calculate marginal willingness to pay. So we're gonna use these sort of behavioral models, calculate marginal willingness to pay to sort of avoid advisories per, um, when you go camping. So these are gonna be per trip measures. And we're gonna do that for each of the years. And so that's what we see on this graph. Um, we see for each of the years, the sort of calculated marginal willingness to pay to reduce one advisory. So if we just look at 2014, it was about 30 bucks or $31 um, per trip um, to avoid a water quality advisory. 2015, you see, okay, that's a lot less. And in fact, the sort of error bounds cross into the uh, negative territory. So it's not statistically significant. And then you can see the rest of the years um, sort of between sort of 10, 20 or 10, $25 per year. So in terms of that first research question, are people, do people respond to water quality advisories? Sort of we look at the coefficients, they seem to be negative overall. We look at sort of the welfare measures. Yes, these are having a cost to people um, overall. But because we have these eight years of data, it might be interesting to kind of compare um, across different years. And what do I mean by that is, well, let's just say we had 2014 data and we wanted to estimate what uh, the welfare marginal willingness to pay is in 2015 or 2016 or 2017. So we're gonna do all these pairwise comparisons between each of the model estimates and the sort of out of sample or all the alternative year results. So we're gonna do some statistical tests of the difference in these marginal willingness to pay to understand, well, how reliable are these estimates. Um, typically, this sort of temporal reliability test, they usually get done just with one or just two or uh, maybe three years of data. Here we have sort of eight years of data. And I think, again, just to highlight why this is important is, well, well often when we go out and do these studies to begin with, you know, we go out, collect data, estimate models, get to uh, estimates for sort of 2014, by the time sort of these estimates get used in any sort of policy analysis or benefit cost analysis, it's usually, you know, not in the same year and probably not even the next year. It could be two, three, four, five years or even more in the future. So understanding how reliable these sort of temporal dimensions are is really important, right? Um, as well as just sort of other sort of benefit transfer exercises. We're gonna take some of these estimates and use them in Saskatchewan. Yes, we have that spatial dimension that's important, but all as well that temporal. Hmm, we're using estimates from 10 years ago. How reliable is that over time? <clears throat> just gonna skip over the comparison to the rest of the literature here and just look at the test. And I know this text is a bit small, but I just want you to look at sort of the overall trend overall, which is on average, it's about a 50-50, right? So the value estimates, when we do all those different comparisons between the years, um, it's about 57% of the time they're statistically different. And so about 43% of the time they're uh, indistinguishable, at least statistically. So this means that if we just have one year of data trying to compare another year, yeah, it's almost like a 50-50 or maybe 60-40 sort of split 
of are we going to get sort of a temporal reliable um, result, at least from the sort of statistical test that we could do. But then it also asks, you know, begs that question of, well, what if we had two years of data, estimate a model, and then try to predict another year? Or what if we had three years of data, or four years, or all the way up to seven years of data, and then try and predict the remaining year? So we can go out, re-estimate the model using different combinations of years, both in terms of what years, as well as how many years, and then try and predict the sort of out of sample or those remaining years left. And again, look at some of these errors uh, overall to say, does having more years of data help reduce these sort of transfer errors? And so here's just sort of three different figures showing the results of this analysis. So this is looking at that difference in marginal willingness to pay, the figure on the left, depending on if you only have one year of data in the model, trying to predict all the remaining years, or two years of data, three years, four years, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can look at some sort of transfer error measures here. We're looking at root mean square error. And I just want to focus your attention to the figure on the right, which shows the sort of relative change in the root uh, mean squared error as we go from two years to one year. So that first part, if we had two years of data compared to one year of data, our sort of transfer error dropped by about 17%, which is not bad, uh, all things considered. But then you can see adding another year, so going from three years to two years, yeah, it's only about 4% further reduction. And then it goes down beyond that. So it seems like based on this, uh, results, having that second year of data is the most, most helpful, and then additional years sort of have a diminishing marginal contribution to reducing transfer errors overall. And then the last sort of result on um, this sort of transfer uh, discussion is, well, what if we're transferring sort of close years, so 2014 to 2015 relative to 2014 trying to predict 2020 or 2019, sort of further away years. So does sort of using estimates from kind of closer years give less transfer error? And so we can use all the model comparisons that we've done so far, look at the average difference in years on the x-axis, and then look at sort of the absolute difference in marginal willingness to pay. This just shows a sort of scatter plot with a very simple linear regression line, which does seem to suggest that as the average difference in years increases, the absolute difference in marginal willingness to pay also increases. So it does seem like having doing those sort of transfers just from 2015 to 2016 is more reliable than going from 2015 to 2020, which perhaps is intuitive for us to think about, but this provides some empirical evidence in that regard. Okay, the final uh, result I wanted to share from this initial study um, is trying to look within a season. So not so much across different years or different seasons, but within a season, what happens when the water quality advisory gets issued? What happens to behavior? What happens to sort of associated value with that? And I think why this is important, and it also sort of, gives us uh, more trust in the sort of identification of the water quality response that we're seeing. Because one of the challenges here is water quality tends to be worse on when the weather gets better. So there's sort of really disentangling the impact of water quality on recreation behavior is challenging because on a really hot day, people like to go camping, especially camping near a lake. But that's also uh, when they're more likely to have blue-green algae bloom or other sort of adverse water quality incidents. So it's actually really challenging to kind of disentangle the two. But so what we're going to try and do here is estimate a model with all eight years of data. So the whole sort of gamut of data that we have. And then we're going to include different sort of indicator variables for the water quality advisory from the week it was until it was issued and then after it was issued. So this is going to allow us to capture sort of both the within season variation as well as the across season variation in water quality. And so here I'll just show the results and I'll just kind of walk through it here. So again, on the y axis, we're having the marginal willingness to pay to reduce one water quality advisory. And then on the x axis, we have 
So we can tell or since a water quality was issued. So, and these are all normalized to the week before a water quality advisory was issued. So if we just look at sort of the left-hand part of the graph or the parts with the sort of negative weeks, we can see on the weeks leading up to the water quality being, uh, water quality advisory being issued, there's sort of no real sort of significant trend in sort of behavior and sort of associated marginal willingness to pay. So that's sort of a good thing, right? Because we'd be concerned if we saw a lot of response sort of preemptively or anticipating a water quality um, um, being uh, issued, an advisory being issued, sorry. On the right-hand side of the graph with those sort of positive numbers, we can see that since an advisory has been issued. So we can see for that first week, we can see that, yeah, people are starting to respond. Here, we're sort of seeing that in the marginal willingness to pay. Um, sorry, it's starting to get reduced. And then as we go up, it's sort of, that by the second week, it sort of plateaus at about, you know, 10 to $15 uh, range. And that sort of holds steady throughout the rest of the weeks in the data set that we've looked at. So this is sort of showing that once a water quality advisor gets issued, there's actually the response is sort of immediate, kind of halfway there by the first week. And then by the second week, we sort of see that full, uh, full response for the remaining weeks uh, as well. So this is trying to looking at that week by week dynamic gives us a little bit more confidence that what we're capturing by water quality advisory is actually the impact of the advisory, not some sort of confounding variable. But it also shows that um, these uh, um, value estimates the dynamics of them, they sort of plateau um, quite quickly after the advisory gets issued. So just to summarize here, yes, people do respond to advisories, which on the one hand you say, great, they work. But on the other hand, we know that means that they have associated economic costs for uh, recreators. We can also do a whole bunch of different reliability tests. And we see that in general, there's not sort of, uh, you're definitely gonna get temporally stable estimates over time. It's about you know, 60, 40% of the time, you won't get a sort of reliable estimate. But if we use more years of data, we can have sort of better confidence in our data, in our um, estimates as well. Of course, at 20, um, 20, 2020 and 2021 years, we're uh, during the pandemic. So we can also kind of see, was there much of a difference with the pandemic and without the pandemic? We don't really seem to find that. They were quite similar between the 2019 and 2020 years as well, um, or even those earlier years as well. And then people respond quite quickly to advisories overall. Okay, so that was study number one. Luckily, study number two is still at its very early days. So there's not as much to share. So it'll go a bit, uh, a bit quicker overall. Um, but here we're going to look at house prices and we're going to think about how they um, or does water quality affect house prices. Here we're going to look at southern Ontario um, and there's a lot of literature in the U.S. that find this sort of positive relationship. The better the water quality, the higher the house prices, but there's more limited evidence in Canada. In particular, there's only a couple of quite small studies using sort of, you know, maybe 100 sales in the Muskoka region of uh, Ontario. And so here we're gonna kind of expand that and use sort of a larger data set in all of uh, Southern Ontario. Now, when people are going out to buy a home, water quality might not be the number one reason why they're buying a home. You know, there's a, obviously a whole bunch of other factors influencing that decision, but it might play a part. And especially in different parts of Ontario. So in the very small text in my Google search earlier this morning, I put in Muskoka, and what came up in the images? Well, a whole bunch of beautiful lakes. And so there are parts of Ontario where sort of called lake country or cottage country. And a big part of this is lake-based recreation. So we're sort of interested in to what degree do the water quality at these lakes influence those nearby um, home prices. But of course, when we think about sort of, well, what sort of water quality measure might matter for people, there's likely, there's not really going to be a single metric that captures all the different types of benefits that people get, as well as people are probably going to have quite heterogeneous um, preferences over these different metrics. So some people, if you like fishing, you might like a sort of a fishing catch rate type measure. If you like biodiversity or the ecosystem, you might sort of want sort of more naturalized lake. If you really like swimming, you might want really clear 
uh, water quality or water clarity. So there's, you know, people are going to be different. There's probably no single metric to capture all these amenity benefits. And it's sort of an open question. Well, what do people actually respond to? We can have that sort of broader discussion. Of course, when it comes to trying to do an empirical study, we're often limited to, well, what data is available? And uh, as other uh, speakers have talked about in this series, water quality data in Canada always sort of brings a tear to our eyes because there's not much of it, right? So we're often quite limited in terms of what water quality measures that are available. So we could dream up or, you know, an amazing one, but do we actually have this data on sort of a regional scale or a big enough scale to be included in the analysis? Which brings me to the measure that's going to get used in this study, which is Secchi Dow. And uh, one reason why I like this is I somewhat understand it relative to some of the other measures, but also it's sort of a not a chemical based one. So you can just go out and anyone with a little bit of training can go out and collect it. And what that means is it's one of the most commonly collected water quality measures in North America. And subsequently it gets used a lot in different hedonic uh, studies, at least in the US. But basically you just throw a disc down and walk, measure the depth until you can't see it anymore. Or that's my uh, economist explanation of it. On the image on the left, you can see how these discs kind of change depending on different water quality. And then so you just measure the depth, right? The greater the depth, the better the sort of water clarity is at the lake. Um, so for this study, we're going to use three different sets of data. So we're going to go out and collect a whole bunch of different Secchi depth readings. Um, Ontario has a great lake partners program where they have a whole bunch of volunteers that submit um, Secchi depth readings, um, as well as their sort of other sort of more regional based. So in Muskoka, they collect a lot of water quality data because water quality is a big, uh, big part of the Muskoka culture. Um, there's other sort of gov governmental sources as well. We're going to kind of compile all this use sort of annual averages. So we have about 5,000 stations and about 20,000 station year pairs. So we get this water clarity data as our sort of measure of water quality. And then we're also gonna look at host sales data. And for this, we get data from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. So this is someone who sets the sort of assessed values. If you live in Ontario, these are the folks that are assessing what your home is worth. And we're gonna focus on rural sales. So sort of non-urban sales, of course, over this 2002 to 2019, the sort of rural urban boundaries have changed a little bit, um, but we're focusing on rural areas. We have about 500,000 sales and this, you know, there's really tons of variables in this data set because this is a data set they use to assess property value. So there's a full suite of structural characteristics of the home, as well as different sort of neighborhood control variables. We'll calculate a few on our own. And then to bring these together, we're going to also bring in some lake GIS data. So we're going to measure, get different uh, GIS data on lakes, relate the Secchi depth readings to the lakes, relate the house sales distance to different lakes um, to do the analysis. We're going to be estimating a hedonic uh, price uh, function. So we're going to be trying to explain prices as a function of water quality, in addition to a whole bunch of different control variables here. Um, and in this case, we're gonna sort of just focus on with um, water quality affecting home prices within about 500 meters of the lake. So this is quite a localized sort of effect. This is roughly based on other, um, um, other studies in the US that have sort of found similar sort of boundaries, but we're still kind of playing around. Should it be 250, should it be 1000? And then for control variables, so yeah, there's, you know, there's actually like hundreds in the data set trying to put in the sort of most relevant ones um, that sort of could help us kind of control for some of these confounding influences that could impact water quality and prices, include some sort of neighborhood effects sort of distance to the nearest city or the metropolitan area, as well as distance to um, greater Toronto area. You know, this is because lakes that are further away, kind of further up north, probably have better water quality, but sort of less desirable perhaps because they're further away from population centers. So we could, if we don't include these sort of distance measures, we might um, sort of misassociate that relationship as well as we're gonna use a bunch of spatial fixed effects. So we're gonna try and really um, do our best job of kind of controlling for these other localized amenities by using these spatial fixed effects. We're gonna kind of use township or ward level ones 
and we're going to interact with, with ears. So we're going to really try and do as good of a job of sort of trying to control for those other spatial amenities that we also know are important for house prices. Okay, and the sort of three prelim preliminary results I have to share uh, with you today. So uh, seems like for the house prices that are within 500 meters of the lake, we see about a 5% premium um, for a one meter increase in Seki depth. So relative to uh, those other homes. And again, this is just within that 500 meter buffer of the lake. Um, not surprisingly, the price premium is higher for waterfront homes. So if you're a home right on the waterfront, the price premium is quite a bit higher. And then we've also started to explore some of these repeated sales analysis. So obviously, there's going to be a whole bunch of factors affecting um, property sales overall. And so one way to try and isolate just the impact of water quality is to just look at repeated sales. So these are sales that have been sold more than twice or more in the data um, set over our time period. And if we just focus on these repeated sales data, so it sort of really controls for all the structural characteristics as well as all those other um, spatial amenities, we find that actually host prices are kind of double compared to the um, the full data set or that don't use a repeated sales analysis. And we're still trying to figure out, is this because of the better identification that comes from this repeated sales analysis, or is this just something to do with this, because um, we're only using about half the data, maybe there's just a certain um, influence of just that uh, subset of data. So we're still exploring there, and I'd be happy to take some uh, feedback on that overall. And so just to conclude here, um, you know, I'm going to say there's a lot we can learn um, from Canadians' behaviors and choices about how they value water. Sort of this presentation focused on quality clarity, but, you know, we can think about water quantity, naturalized river flows, just even access to uh, drinking water or other sort of aspects of water, health risks, and a whole bunch of other uh, aspects as well. So I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff we can do in this world. We have the kind of tools, we have the techniques, but we're often limited to the data, by the data. Um, and part of that is just not having good measures of water quality or water quantity or water access, right? So having better data on objective measures, as well as sort of per perceptions around this, I think would be really helpful, as well as sort of pairing that with better behavioral data. We also don't know much about how Canadians are using water, or interacting with water in a whole bunch of different ways. So I think there's a lot more we could do in this, uh, this space. And I think part of this is trying to bring all these insights together in these sort of integrated assessment models so we can have a better answer to the question of what is the social cost of water pollution in Canada? So we have the social cost of carbon that gets used a lot in different uh, policy analysis and economic analysis discussions. Can we do something similar on the water side? That's sort of one of my uh, hopes uh, going forward. And I'd be happy to chat with people that would uh, be interested in that, as well as sort of, I, you know, set this up at the beginning of stated preference for real preference. And there's a lot we can do to kind of combine the two and use the sort of strengths of both. So uh, I'll uh, end there. Thank you for uh, your attention and uh, happy to answer questions for the discussion. Thank you, Pat. Excellent. Very nice presentation. There is one or two questions already in the Q&A um, and, and I can read them out loud for you. So John, John Livernois is asking, um, are you assessing property values or do you use actual sales values in the, in the hedonic pricing study? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question, John. So yeah, this data is from the assessment corporation, but it is the actual sales data. So this is actual sales uh, data. So they, they collect a bone. Um, I'd actually have to see it. I think we do have the assessed values as well, which could be actually kind of interesting to compare the two. Um, but this is actual real sales. Yeah. Okay. Then um, Evans Dawson is asking uh, for the first uh, study, um, were the cancelled reservations not included by choice or because they were unavailable? If available or could be available in the future? I would think cancelled reservations could provide some valuable information. For example, if cancellation happened after an advisory and then that person rescheduled into a location without an advisory. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, and I completely agree. So they weren't available in the data set. So we don't, we don't see them, which is uh, really too bad because I know in the US, 
Um, they've done some really interesting stuff with camping reservations and wildfire risks and just seeing how when wildfire risk changes, how does that impact kind of cancellation rates? So I completely agree. It would be really interesting if we had access to that data um, just to see. Um, because you're right, like, you know, some people probably won't know that there's an advisory in place until they show up to go camping. And absolutely. And in a way, I was sort of surprised to see such a strong response, given that this is sort of camping, right? I mean, they're just by going camping, you don't necessarily have to go into the water or, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so some people might not know or might not even care that there's an advisory in place. Well, I have no plans to go swimming anyway. Because um, as you can imagine, some of these Alberta campgrounds, the water is pretty cold, even in the middle of August. So, yeah, you know, but I think because we do see an impact, it sort of makes it seem that this is probably like a lower bound on what that impact would be if we had sort of fully informed people on advisories overall. Thanks, Pat. So when, so when when they booked the 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 the, uh, the camping site, they didn't have the information. So when did they find out about the advisory? Yeah, so partly that depends on when they booked. Um, and so people, some people would book well in advance. That's another aspect of the information that we don't have. We don't have when they booked, which we could, you know, use to kind of do a better job of disentangling people that kind of just showed up or booked the night before and the people that uh, uh, booked, you know, perhaps even uh, weeks or months in advance. Um, so yeah, so some people would do that. Um, some people would book sort of a month in advance and then maybe an advisory would pop up a week or two before their reservation and then they would cancel and we would just not see them in the data at all. So though that's maybe some of the response that we're seeing is that people that have sort of canceled, but yeah. Okay. And um, um, maybe a question um, from my side. So you also mentioned that, uh, so you had, what was it? 70 or 80 um, camping sites, but then, but then um, just over half of them or, or more than half of them had, a, had at least one leg. So, so the, the ones that didn't have a leg were obviously not included. Yeah, so the ones that didn't, so basically it's either a lake or a river. You know, there's not too many camping sites that are, they just put people out on the prairie plain and no, no access to water. So the ones that don't have a lake, you typically have a river. Um, and all the camping sites that were included that are available for the full eight years were included. So both those with lakes as well as those without lakes. And part of the reason why that was the case is I think that's sort of relevant to people's decision of where they're going to go, both lake and river-based camping. Of course, advisories only happen at um, campgrounds or at lakes, uh, campgrounds next to lakes, so they don't happen on rivers. Um, but the full sort of both uh, types of campsites were included in the analysis. Okay. Um, John has another question. What part of the total value of water quality is being captured by the hedonic results and what parts are not captured? In other words, if you were to do additional studies, which ones would you avoid so as to not be double counting and which ones would you do? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Really tough one. And I wish I had a great answer for you. Um, and, you know, I think it's something that we're struggling with in terms of just, you know, as, as a discipline on, okay, well, we go out and do all these studies, a hedonic one, a recreation one, maybe a state of preference study. Now, how do we aggregate these up? Um, so part of the reason why, why using a nice sort of just 500 meter buffer or quite a small buffer is that I think we can have better trust that we're just capturing sort of amenity benefits which I understand amenity is still sort of a bit of a vague uh, word, but probably a bit less so sort of recreation um, uh, values that we typically capture in a travel cost model because most travel cost models, you know, the, you're, we're examining decisions where people are actually traveling sort of more than just 500 meters. So I think we're a bit safer if we restrict the boundary on these hedonic price studies to also include recreation studies. Um, some studies have actually kind of included both. So they've tried to do a hedonic study while incorporating recreation values as well. I think there's a lot we can do there to understand. So I, yeah, I think it's a good, good question on sort of what's exactly being captured here. And I think partly uh, when it comes to this aggregation question, we need to be careful with each of the studies that we're potentially considering understanding that boundaries. But I don't think we'll ever get there kind of perfectly but I think we can try and do something a bit more defensively going forward. Yeah. Thank 
to Pat. Uh, maybe a, 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 a question about what you presented at the beginning. Um, so the overview that you gave of, of these valuation studies in, in Canada, that was very interesting, I thought. Um, I, I was just wondering there um, why, why there were so many more stated preference studies over the last 10, 20 years if if the main focus seemed to be on these recre recreational use values was that related to your point at the end that that you ideally would like to also test conversion validity of these of these studies yeah so you know so well there's a little bit of a disconnect in terms of what the revealed state of preference studies were just for canada and then all those recreation studies were canada and the us um but yeah i mean like to be honest, when I finally kind of pulled it all together and just kind of looked at the numbers, I, you know, I, I knew state of preference was becoming a bit more popular, but I, I was pretty surprised at just how few revealed preference studies are, are done in Canada these days um, overall. But uh, I think, you know, and even sort of recreation studies are being done in sort of a state of preference format um, overall. And, and, you know, there's a lot of good reasons why we would want to do that. Um, but I think there's still this role for these revealed preference studies going forward. I don't know Absolutely. if that answered your question there, but um, well, well, a little bit. It 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 also puzzled me a little bit why that actually wasn't the case. And 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 I think you're you're making an important point that um, policymakers often trust more revealed preference data than than stated preference data. There's a lot of discussion about hypothetical bias, etc., when it comes to these stated preference data and. And so, yeah, you would maybe expect a bit more uh, reveal preference studies um, in, 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 in that sense, data preference. Yeah, uh, no, it's, yeah. it's an open question. And, you know, if anyone has, you know, thoughts, I'd be happy to hear them uh, over email or uh, a message, you know, of just why they might think one way or the other, because it's sort of something I, you know, have a few ideas about why that might be the case, but still mostly puzzled uh, over anything else. Okay, we're, we're approaching the end. If there's any more questions for Pat, please let us know. Pat, I like the uh, results that you presented about um, uh, temporal stability of your, of your values. It, it reminded me a lot of, of the findings in the, in the band trans literature where, where they compare results across multiple sites. Also there, when you pool data, uh, from multiple sites or you even in the international benefits transfer literature if you pool countries usually your transfer errors go go down so that's a very nice consistent uh, re result that you presented there mm -hmm. um, great yeah okay i don't see any other questions so pat thank you so much for your for your time and for the excellent presentation it was really insightful very many thanks to you thank you all for listening in and and asking your your questions we're looking forward to see you again in a month's time. On the 7th of December, we'll have Professor Diane Dupont giving a presentation about uh, the risks of flooding and how these risks affect uh, Canadian households. So we look forward to see you again on the 7th of December, same time, uh, 12 noon Eastern time. Um, take care, stay well, and, and thank you all for, for joining us for today's webinar. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, thanks everyone for the discussion. Thanks, Roy, for putting it on. Thank you.